Good afternoon and good evening from everywhere you're logging in from. Uh, welcome to this exciting con conversation on the future of conservation, hosted by the Aspen Initiative Africa in Nairobi. Uh, we are part of the Aspen Institute community um, that has existed for the last 74 years and drives change through dialogue, leadership, and action to help solve the greatest challenges of our time. At the Aspen Initiative in Africa, we foster enlightened leadership that makes a moral and intellectual contribution to the development of society in Africa and worldwide. My name is Daniel Ayela Bola from the Aspen Initiative Africa, and we are all excited to have you join us for this webinar. We are happy to have our panelists with us. At this point, I'd like to uh, introduce our panelists. And we'll begin with uh, Dr. Emmanuel Mugende, who is a lecturer in environmental policy assessments at the De Department of Environmental Science uh, at the University of Botswana. His research interests are in political ecology and political economy of wildlife conservation in Southern Africa. You're welcome, Dr. Mugende. Um, I'd also like to, int uh, to introduce uh, Richard Vignan, uh, Executive Director of the School of Wildlife Conservation at the Africa Leadership University. Um, and before this, he was the CEO of Olpegeta Conservancy, the largest uh, black rhino sanctuary in East Africa, and one of the most su successful enterprises in Africa. He was born and brought up in Kenya, and he has more than 20 years of experience in conservation. And uh, prior to coming to Olpegeta, he spent six years operating a safari company throughout Uganda and um, Eastern Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And Richard has completed a number of conservation and land use uh, related consultancies for various organizations, including Conservation Capital and the Africa Wildlife Foundation. You're very welcome, Richard, thank you. Uh, Chris Foote is the board chair at Arocha, Kenya. And um, he also sits on the board of the Kenya Wildlife Service he has a wealth of experience and passion for conservation and Kenya's biodiversity. Chris has been a chairman and a board member of numerous environmental and conservation organizations for over 20 years and in varied ecosystems, including the Masai Mara, Laikipia, the coast, Nairobi, and Samburu. He has also had many years of experience working with the government, where he has sat at, as board chair of the Kenya Film Commission for six years and was a member of the Kenyan, uh, pre Kenyan Presidential Task Force for the Recovery of Tourism. You're welcome, Chris. Uh, and last but not least, I'd like to um, welcome our director, um, the Director Aspen Initiative Africa, Dr. Laila Masharia, who's uh, raised in Kenya, Namibia, and Somalia, and is a serial entrepreneur and investor in Nairobi. She chairs the board of the Africa Digital Media Institute, uh, which is East Africa's premier learn and work creative technology community, which over the last decade has trained over 5,000 students from 30 different countries. Laila is the founding director of the Aspen Initiative Africa, Nairobi, as well as the chair of APSA Life Insurance and vice chair of uh, CENTAM, the latter listed on the Nairobi Stock Exchange. And at this point, um, I'd like to welcome our moderator, Dr. Laila Masharia. You can take it up from here. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. A true pleasure to be here to discuss this really important topic and to have this conversation with my friends. <laughs> so uh, we will be starting a conversation on conservation. Uh, many of you know that this is a topic that is very dear to the hearts of many Africans. Uh, many of us feel um, that this is an emotive subject because wildlife is so dear to us and so symbolic. And we were speaking earlier about the elephant in particular being somehow quite emotive. I, we, we hear in studies sometimes that elephants are just like us, their family structure is like us, they grieve like us. And uh, so when we discuss this topic, we often find that people bring very high and strong opinions to this topic. But today we want to go a little bit deeper than the headlines and understand what really works in conservation? What is there that we might not be seeing in the headlines? And what can we learn from those parts of the continent where there are successes and, uh, and see if those could translate into policies that can be adopted elsewhere? 
We'd also like to get a sense, especially for those of us who are not embedded in wildlife, about the different dynamics in the wildlife economy, what science is telling us, um, the politics of conservation, so that when we read the headlines next time, we have a more nuanced view of the dynamics of this important sector. So we're going to be starting with a segment where we'll be learning from Dr. Emmanuel Mogende uh, from Botswana. A lot of you know that uh, Botswana is often hailed as a success story in the area of conservation, while many African countries uh, struggle with declining numbers, especially when you think of elephants, for example. We've heard that some Southern um, African nations have the opposite problem. They've been so successful in conserving that they're actually, the image we get is that they're overrun <laughs> by these large creatures. And so we'd like to hear whether um, from the South, you consider this a success, what might have led to this experience and how you explain with your extensive um, research experience, Dr. Mogende, uh, how you explain this phenomenon and what you think about it. And if there's any light you could shed on the politics and economics of Botswana's experience. Um, I'll let you just explain your research to us and we'll intervene in a bit before we bring the other discussants on to uh, comment on what you say and also to bring their own views to this discussion. Thank you and welcome. Thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you very much uh, for having me in this interesting discussion on conservation issues in, on the African continent. As you had already, as Leila has already mentioned, Botswana is often considered as a, as a success story in conservation. And this is largely because when you look at it, the wildlife economy is crucially important to the GDP of the country. It comes second after mining. And all this is due to the efforts of the state of the Botswana uh, government. The wildlife conservation of the wildlife economy has not only benefited the state, but has also benefited uh, local communities who actually live or coexist with this wildlife, uh, with this wildlife on day-to-day -day basis. So I, I allude this success story to about to a combination of factors, amongst others being the political will, uh, effective law enforcement, particularly in regards to anti-poaching, and also community involvement. When you look at in terms of policy, Botswana has sort of set up set aside approximately 39% of its land as, uh, as protected. It's 39% of land falls under conservation. And this includes national parks and game reserves, as well as what we'll call uh, wildlife management areas. You find that 22% uh, consist of wildlife management areas. And these wildlife management uh, areas are crucially important uh, for the community-based natural resource management, where communities are involved in the day-to-day -day management of wildlife. And then the remaining 17% uh, consist of national parks and consist of uh, game reserves. The second thing uh, that alludes or contributes to Botswana's success story, I think it's, it's also policy, it's prime policy on tourism, particularly the high cost, low volume, tourism model, which is more so of a greener model. So this sort of model, it aims to minimize the ecological footprint in Botswana's conservation areas by attracting high fewer paying tourists who mostly emanate from the global south, from the global north, emanating from Europe, US, China, and so forth. So the reason why the government came with this policy, I think it was implemented in 1990, and it was trying to deal away with mass tourism that we have seen being experienced in countries such as uh, Kenya, for instance. So it was trying to sort of alleviate that particular problem and also to try to protect fragile ecosystems that we have. For instance, the Okavango Delta, which is the Ramsar site, is a wetland of international importance and also that sustains these elephants that we have. So this is one of the policies that uh, the policy that I think also had played a particularly crucial role in terms of protecting the ecosystem and the wildlife resources that we 
actually have today, which now tourists from the global north actually interested in viewing these particular products that we have. And then the third factor again, I alluded to the effective law enforcement that the country has. Botswana currently tolerates zero tolerance to, to, to poaching, to poaching. And it has done sort of massive investments in training its rangers. And also that now we also have a state entity, state security entity involved in the protection of wildlife, which is the Botswana Defense Force. It has played a very crucial role in terms of um, protecting environmental assets, in this case, wildlife, that will that continues to benefit the current generation and also will in the future benefit our future generation and also the third one the last the last one is mostly uh, our Botswana's elephant protection is not only state driven but also involves communities participation of local communities who live alongside the elephants and also who bear the costs of human wildlife conflict. So what, and they are, uh, they do this through the community-based natural resource management prog uh, program. As you are all aware, you'll know that CBNRM or community-based conservation initiatives came as a result of the environmental injustice that was experienced be, uh, in the, during the colonial era. So it was trying to rectify that. And its main three objectives is conservation, rural, and improvement in rural uh, livelihoods, as well as trying to devolve power, the management power to local communities. So communities are involved in day to day. They are given tourism concessions where they manage these particular concessions. They derive financial incentives. So once they derive financial incentives, that then makes them sort of to take care of the environment to take care of the resources that surround their concessions. And also at community level as well, there's a program that we call MOMS. It's sort of a monitoring, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a monitoring platform where communities on day to day, they patrol their areas and report sort of any illegal incidences that is happening in their area. And so they've been able sort of to achieve uh, to sort of protect wildlife at, at a local scale. So you can see there's a national scale as well as a uh, local scale. And then also another important thing is, is collaboration with, uh, with neighboring countries through the TFCA program, the Transfrontier Conservation Area Program. And also I think they are also, they are also known as Peace Parks. So Botswana is part of uh, the Kavango Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area, which includes about five countries, being Angola, Namibia, Zimbabwe, and Zambia. So this is more of a regional collaboration in managing wildlife. In 2022, the, the five countries through CASA managed to conduct uh, what they call the CASA Elephant Survey. And it was an involvement of all these five countries coming together. And in that, in their findings, they actually showed that the elephant population in these five countries is actually stable, it's not declining. So that shows the collaborative efforts. So Botswana is not only alone. So you can see that there are sort of three layers in trying to protect uh, wildlife. You have the national, you have the regional in terms of CASA, then you have got state commitment, the political will that comes from the state, as well as lastly, and as well as lastly, the local at the local scale, you have got these local communities who come together and uh, protect wildlife. So that is as much as that I can share for now in terms of uh, how Botswana has been able to sort of safeguard wildlife and also becoming a success story internationally. That's a really good overview of some of the different dynamics that come into play and some of the initiatives that you think combined um, have helped Botswana and its neighbors uh, maintain the population of um, of the elephants at least. Um, 
So I'm going to invite the other guests and discussants that we have. So Chris and Richard, I'm just inviting you to join the conversation. Oh, I can see there's a question already. And the question here is, um, what are some of the challenges? What, what is a major threat or challenge of conservation in Botswana and how is this being addressed? Um, when we uh, put out this topic, we heard a lot of um, comments from different people talking about different um, voices or interests within conservation. You did allude to this colonial legacy where you say that perhaps in the past, in uh, colonial times, there was a perception that the fruits of conservation, if you like, or the econo economic benefit was not well, well shared. Um, we can we can delve into that a little bit. And we've also heard um, comments coming in from some of the participants about this idea that regulation of this field uh, mostly comes from outside, from outside Africa, and that that can bring in some dynamics. Um, so we'll start with the first. Um, maybe the team can can shed light on this colonial legacy and what people mean when they talk about that and how maybe conservation is evolving since then. I mean, I think it's a very good point. I think, um, you know, I'm speaking a little bit perhaps from the perspective of Kenya, but Kenya is um, one of the key differences between the way Kenya tries to 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 run its wildlife assets is, and, and, and the way that Botswana does it is that in Kenya, the ownership of the asset vests entirely with the government. So there is no, um, the, the, um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the the local people who live with wildlife or who live adjacent to wildlife uh, tend to have no way often of benefiting from that wildlife or those wilderness areas. So you end up in a situation of, it's changed a little bit in recent years, but the colonial legacy is one of national parks where you have so-called fortress conservation. You have areas set aside purely for wildlife with a little bit of tourism from which people are almost completely excluded. Now that has changed a little bit with the conservancy movement in Kenya over the past 10 or 15 years, which I've been part of, but a large part of the, 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 the money that is required to look after wildlife in Kenya comes from well-meaning philanthropic organizations and people based in the global north. And most people would argue that that is it's it's simply not sustainable, but I would take it a step further than that. I think Africa sits upon uh, a natural heritage, which in the modern global situation is becoming incredibly valuable. Um, and it is incumbent upon African governments through policy to recognize the inherent value of the natural heritage upon which they sit. And if properly managed and if properly leveraged, that that asset can become a highly investable opportunity, which instead of being, at least in the case of some countries, an economic burden actually becomes an opportunity for economic development and empowerment. And I think that's the change we're beginning to see. Uh, it's taking some time. And of course, there are many countries which are ahead of other countries. But of course, that colonial legacy, that legacy of national parks and fortress conservation still persists in many areas and, to, and until such time as communities across Africa living with wildlife can see economic benefit from it, uh, the chances of it being preserved um, at the kind of levels that we would like to see are going to be very small. And Botswana amongst others is a pretty good um, example of how things could be done going forward. No, oh, excellent. Lots to unpack there. So, so many important things. I can see Chris has his hand up. Chris. Yeah, I think one of the thanks, Dr. Magenda, for your 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 input there, and a lot of things which we're trying to align with in Kenya. Certainly, community based conservation is one of them. Transboundary stuff is very key to us. But I think people have to be aware of our starting points were very different, which is um, you know. Botswana began its conservation model in an ecosystem that wouldn't be acceptable nowadays in terms of how one deals with the community. And I think that's that's just a statement of fact. Um, you know, in terms of evictions and um, 
versus voluntary relocations and social license of communities, those sort of issues which weren't really at the forefront in the 90s, but are very much so now. So we have to be a lot more sensitive to communities and to our social license with communities and you know, even things as basic as free prior and informed consent in terms of how we how we deal with communities. So what might have taken a year or two to do down south now requires a lot more input from the communities because quite rightly, um, whilst the state owns the land, the communities have been custodians of, of that biodiversity for millennia. And now in Kenya, particularly, we have a devolved system where actually there's a real tension between what is a national asset and what is a county asset. And that's something we're having to address it with our national parks, um, let alone our reserves, which are owned by counties, which people will be aware of. So we have some tensions there that really don't, didn't exist in the 90s and which um, certainly are things we have to tread carefully with now. But I do think, um, as Richard pointed out, the need now for moving on from our model, we got some things wrong, absolutely. You know, our high traffic footfall um, model was appalling. And I think we're trying to redress that with a lot of incentive-based conservation benefiting the communities. And, and the, the big question is, how do we do that? And I guess we'll, we'll come on to that, but um, it's that, that just to put that in context that we're, we're coming from slightly different backgrounds on that. So again, for those of us who are outside, you've, you've highlighted a few things in this conversation. So on one hand, you're saying that, uh, well, the first thing is of course, Botswana from a population standpoint um, is able to reserve large la large portions of land um, for for wildlife which in some other African countries might not be realistic um, I don't think we would go as far as saying that even in Kenya there's actually not enough land to set aside and, and that I think for somebody who's um, not in the field it sounds quite simplistically a solution but I think Richard what might be new for for some of us to hear is this idea that um, setting aside animals is not a sustainable thing because I think when people are doing that, they're doing it with this idea that that is protecting the animals from humans and that that's a good thing. But you are casting a vision of more of an interaction between these two um, kind of, I don't know what you would call us, species or groups of species. Tell us what that would look like in real life. Or maybe, I don't know if that's the reality in Botswana, but paint a picture of us because I think for us, because I think people in Kenya would find it difficult to imagine anything other than what we've grown up seeing. And I think this would be the same for, for many Africans that, you know, kind of higher up in the continent. T tell me what that looks like so we understand. What have we been doing wrong that, that should change? Sure. Let, let me let me let me try to explain it. Um I, th I think a lot of people um have have evolved in their mind the notion that wildlife uh, is somehow, let's call it biodiversity, have evolved in their mind the notion that, that, the notion that um, somehow wildlife and people are two separate things and that biodiversity is, is something that is kind of nice to have, uh, but is not something that is really essential for the well-being of people. Well, that notion is increasingly being um, challenged and it's being challenged on the basis of what are referred to as ecosystem services. So what do I mean by ecosystem services? A very simple example would be the services that insects provide to humanity uh, through the pollination of crops. Um, now that that service is, is in terms of crop production globally is worth many billions of dollars. And there are places now in the world, I'm not talking about Africa, where insect populations have been so reduced that actually the pollination services they provide have been almost entirely removed. As a result of which you have evolving industries of beekeepers who literally have to transport bees from farm to farm in America in order for pollination of crops to take place because the natural populations of insects as a result of habitat change, use of insecticides, and et cetera, et cetera, have disappeared. That's just one example of an ecosystem service. So I think the world is beginning to understand the value of that. Whereas before, we simply used biodiversity as if there was no end and it was for free. Um, in fact, it's not for free and we have to steward it and we have to look after it. And that leads me on to the next kind of point, which is the globe has now begun to realize that it needs to find a way 
to, in inverted commas, set aside at least 30% of the surface of the planet to maintain those ecosystem services and those ecological processes that I'm talking about. And I'm talking about fisheries, I'm talking about the marine environment and all that it produces for humans and et cetera, et cetera. But if you then consider a country like Kenya, right now the national parks cover an area of sort of 12%, I think it is, maybe even less, uh, of the total land area, total land and marine area. Well, to go from 12% to 30%, which is, um, which is an agreement that Kenya has, an international agreement that Kenya has signed up to, is not going to happen from the creation of more national parks. That's just politically untenable. It's just never going to happen. So we have to find different methods of getting to that 30% figure without creating national parks. So what does that mean? It means that people are going to have to find a way of living sustainably with nature. And that is what modern conservation is all about. It's not about national parks. A very simple example before I finish. Um, my, I spent time on Old Pegeta. When I got to Old Pegeta, we used to persecute lions and hyenas um, because they ate our cattle. Um, in fact, lions were referred to as vermin. We had a big book and we used to record livestock movement. And if they were killed by a lion, uh, they, they was killed by vermin. We then created and made a conservancy, but we didn't remove the cattle in the process. What we did is we integrated the cattle operation, 7,000 head of cattle with wildlife. And we ended up with a profitable herd of cattle with some of the biggest populations of lions and other predators in East Africa, all running on the same piece of land. So it demonstrates that it's possible. And in fact, it made the land much more productive and profitable on a per acre basis than it had been before. So those are the kinds of models that I'm talking about. And of course, there's much more that has evolved and many more opportunities in that regard that have evolved since. Uh, but that, that, I hope, gives you an example of, of how it is possible to live um, in harmony with nature. We don't need to separate ourselves from it. We need to find mm -hmm. a way of living sustainably with it. So, so this will be really surprising for people to hear. I know you're saying that the field is evolving towards this, and I think people in conservation understand this is the new trend. And uh, But I think for the rest of us, this sounds really actually quite radical, because while our ancestors might have had this skill set of living with nature, I think most of us, the example you give is one, we, we don't know how to, right? We, we don't know... Um, what to do if a baboon comes into the garden, right? You call you call pest control. And so it sounds to me like we need a big investment in helping people regain um their skill set in 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 managing um wildlife and other ecosystem services among us. So that's that's really a, a mind blowing and opening I, uh, concept. Just, yeah. Can I just interrupt and say, I mean you're right, and I won't talk mm -hmm. for too much longer because I'm sure Chris has got a lot to say on this subject. Um you're right, but I think there's a there's a slightly deeper deeper sort of uh, discussion to be had here. And I made the point earlier that we've treated the services provided by nature as if they were for free. Um, and we've only begun to realize the cost of not having those services when they've disappeared. So that's my example with insects, for example. Um, when we start to price in the value of nature to everything that we do, and we begin to understand the value of those services, suddenly finding ways of coexisting with those services becomes a whole lot easier. So, so I think actually that's what, it's not really about edu, which is perhaps educating people to be more tolerant of nature or whatever, but if people understood the value of the services provided by nature, so the value of the marine ecosystem in terms of the food that we eat, for example, um, then, then perhaps they would look at it slightly differently and mm. perceptions would change. And I think that's really what this is all about. What we're talking about. Oh, would the other discussants like to comment? Go ahead. Yeah, Chris. I think, um, again, I agree with a lot of what Richard's saying there. I, one area I disagree with is I do think that there is still bandwidth to create more national parks. Um, certainly in Kenya, when we're seeing a lot of our former group ranches, um, which were basically cooperatives, which failed to deliver for their shareholders. So there were basically large tracts of land which were um, put under a management committee, usually with several thousand shareholders, in order to ranch that land or farm it as a cooperative. And they never did. And so what's happened is invariably 
over time, the shareholders have said, listen, you've never delivered a dividend. We actually want a bit of land. So they suddenly divide, not suddenly, over after 20 years, they divided up into five acre plots um, in order to, you know, let people get some value from their land. And of course, that's leading to one of the biggest drivers of um, biodiversity loss here, which is habitat loss, along with the various other things we'll talk about. But I think that's a really big opportunity for creation of new national parks. We've got 300,000 acres in the Loiters at the moment, which are about to be subdivided. And that'd be a classic example for the government or Kenya Wildlife Services to appreciate what is, you know, national capital. It's a national asset. And say, let's invest in that for um, for the for the perpetuity of, of the biodiversity in Kenya. So I think there is still an option. It's, it's diminishing, but I still, I'm not so, I'm still optimistic that there's still cases where we can do that. But I think to his point about, um, you know, payment for ecosystem services, I'll go back a step further and Dr. McGendy as a political ecologist should understand this, which is really conservation is um, inherently political. It's about how one chooses the choices between people and nature and how nature is managed and by whom. That's the fundamental political ecological argument about conservation. And everyone comes at it with different angles. It can be people driven, it can be um, science driven, and increasingly it's been capital driven. Those are the three main models which are coming out in conservation. And they've all got pros and cons to it. But I think one of the things that we have to really look at it is how it interacts with poverty. Because um, certainly for us in the global south, who have most of, you know, we've got the highest concentration of biodiversity in, in the world is in the global south. And that's where the tensions are coming when people are saying we don't want to get involved in, uh, in, in, in carbon emissions. We're still trying to build our industries and build our countries and at what cost. You guys ruined your country with the Industrial Revolution, and now you're telling us, you know, the horse is bolted, close the door. You know, all those conversations, the same conversations are happening with biodiversity. But really, there's about four main ways that you can look at it. One is that, um, and they're all equally valid, but equally conflicted as well. One is that conservation underpins poverty reduction. And that's quite a new way of looking at it. Because what we had in the 90s, particularly out of countries in Norway, was the opposite, which was poverty reduction leads to conservation yeah so they were saying if we if we if we can get people rich then they'll start being better conserv um, conservationists as opposed to the other way around then the third argument came out which is basically the poverty reduction hinders conservation okay because people get more affluent they get more opportunity they want to start building dividing their land putting up fences all those sort of things we become more more consumers and so forth and the fourth aspect was the poverty reduction actually um helps support conservation and they all, all, in this wonderful tension, can deliver. But we have to take, anyone in conservation will tell you it's all about trade-offs, okay? Uh, one of the things we were always taught at university was there's no such thing as a win-win situation. There's always a winner and there's a loser. And you can, you can, you can frame it how you like, but invariably that. And all of those require trade-offs, and they all involve quite a lot of debate and discussion at the politi social political level. So I just want to sort of throw that in. And, and to um, Richard's point about payment for ecosystem services, it is very much that whole incentive-based conservation, I think, is going to be the fundamental driver for conservation, which is what is the benefit to the community and to the country for having their biodiversity. And we can't rely on the inherent value of biodiversity anymore. I can, you can, because you believe it, but somebody who's living next door and who's having his crops destroyed and being lamed, a country which is going bankrupt because they're trying to meet their, you know, their tree cover, you know, obligations globally can't. And I think this is something where we have to look at all those incentive-based conservations, whether it's biodiversity credits, whether it's payment for ecosystem services, whether it's um, anything that touches on, you know, it could be consumptive utilization. I, I know that conversation will, will raise hackles immediately, but we have to look at ostensibly the, the whole idea is that it's an asset and how does an asset give a return that justifies its existence. And certainly in the community-based conservancies I've worked in, our core driver is we have to justify to the communities that these, this wildlife will give them a better return than anything else, okay? Because if it doesn't, then put a car park up, you know, do it. And I, that's always the challenge I always say is, unless we can match what some, a Maasai landowner gets for his land, and he needs to pay school fees and put his kids through university and pay for hospital bills. And we're asking him to indulge us. No, 
we have to make sure he gets the highest return from wildlife to justify keeping it. And I think we have to look at that on a macro scale as well. Yeah, so, so not speaking um, in lofty terms about what wildlife is, but really understanding that these people have real needs and incentives. Um, that's a very interesting way of putting it. So what return is he getting for this wildlife being conserved? Um, here we have a question from the audience. Could the panel give a few more tangible and best practice examples of how communities are or can be involved in conservation in a way that isn't just about economic incentives or benefits, but also about protecting their existing way of life, their rights to self-determination, ETC? Who wants to take that one? I, I can try to attempt that one. It, it's, it's quite a difficult one. Like Chris has said, Wildlife is a resource, is an asset to communities. If we go back history down the line, these are communities that have been evicted from their ancestral land, thrown wherever that wherever they were given land, in the in in the sense that colonialists wanted to preserve or to conserve wildlife. Now. And when we go back down the line again, these communities, they had access to these resources. They used them to satisfy their, their needs. You look at the sand, for instance, their hunting and gathering way of living. So in today's modern era now, where we have got issues of human wildlife conflict, how then do we, I don't see us moving to, to, to a model where we would it incentivize uh, communities because one if they don't receive any incentive they are bound now to sort of commit illegal activities such as uh illegal bush meat hunting for instance poaching for instance if you look at for instance let me give you an example Botswana when it implemented the 2014 hunting ban in Botswana communities a lot of these CBOs or communities there they lost a lot of revenue income people lost jobs and what were the consequences? It affected conservation outcomes. Poaching started emerging. Illegal bushmeat started emerging. So for me, it's about finding. For me, the financial incentive is about restoring that environmental justice, the, uh, environmental injustice that they experienced uh, during the colonial era. So. This our wildlife has to be seen as an asset that sort of promotes their rural livelihoods. And mind you, where most of this wildlife, wildlife is found, these are rural communities where there's no development that is taking place. It's more in the far flung, far flung uh, rural areas where development is not taking, poverty rates are high. So we have to then incentivize these people to sort of uh, protect these assets that benefit the nation as, as well as benefit the local economy. Okay, Richard first, then Chris. You can, okay. Um, I, I mean, I, I agree um, with, all, with all of that. I think increasingly globally, not just in Africa, there is, a, there is an increasing recognition that um, indigenous people and local communities are the ones who have been the most successful at maintaining uh, you know where 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 there has been some maintenance of wildlife and wilderness areas is normally, uh, you know, outside of national parks. I'm talking about. It's normally indigenous people who've lived on that land for, you know, years and years and years who have been successful at doing that. So, absolutely, I think we need to, you know, we need to learn why that is the case. But I don't think that takes away from the need to make sure that in return for their stewardship of these natural resources, uh, which are increasingly being recognized uh, internationally as being incredibly valuable from the perspective of what they provide to humanity, they should be economically rewarded for, for doing that. Um, and I think that's part of the problem. Um, certainly in Africa, those people who are indigenous communities, so-called, who uh, live across large parts of northern Kenya and the sort of Sahel region of Africa are often very marginalized people. 
who have suffered as a consequence of trying to maintain um, their, 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 their livelihood, um, their, 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 their uh, often pastoralist um, livelihood approach. And for me, that's, you know, sooner or later, that that will have to fail and disintegrate as it has as as it as it has in other parts of particularly the global north so you know there's there's a lot to be learned from those people who live as i was trying to explain earlier who have found a way of living um largely in harmony that's probably the wrong word but in harmony with wildlife who've sustained wilderness areas and wildlife as part of the way that they operate their livelihoods but yet they are highly marginalized people often so for me there's something wrong with that equation um, and it's something that needs redressing and it goes back to the point that i was trying to make earlier um, which is wh when wildlife and wilderness becomes valuable because it becomes economically valuable or because it sustains people um, and where it's where its true value is recognized um, my feeling is that that will result in more wilderness uh, um, and more wildlife being um being preserved it will result in an uplift in conservation because it has become investable and valuable and i think that's our challenge um unlike chris i you know the national parks argument is one but i don't think we need to be creating more national parks i think the the national park model which espouses a separation of people and wildlife and biodiversity is actually not the model that we need to be pursuing we need to be learning from indigenous people, understanding how they do it, making that relevant for a modern uh, humanity uh, and placing a value upon the service that it provides as a means to create an economic opportunity which people can benefit. Good, I think, I mean, I think it's very important to be clear. They're not binary. It, it's not national parks or communities or, you know, conservancies. The, 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 it's got to be a multifaceted approach. And I think it's important to remember the history, how national parks came about. National parks came out of America as an area of preserving land for recreation, nothing to do with biodiversity. So all the big national parks in the States came out of how do we create areas for urban recreation? Um, and it's now evolved into, thankfully, into protecting biodiversity. Um, but I do think what we need to look at, and I agree 100% that the local communities have got a lot to contribute. I think that the, the flip side as well is that the poor are often the people who suffer the most when there's biodiversity loss. And I think it's really critical to bear that in mind. So they've got huge skin in the game to walk alongside the biodiversity conversation in terms of conservation. And I, I agree there's a lot we can get in terms of from the communities, but there's a lot which they can get as well um, in terms of even something as basic as well-being. We talk about well-being and conservation. It's not just economic value. Um, and I'd encourage people to have a look at something which is quite unique, which has just come out of UK last year, which is the Das Gupta report. And the Das Gupta report was the first time that the UK Treasury put forward a report whereby natural capital should be considered in macroeconomic thinking. It's the first time that's ever happened. And it's been a fundamental pivot into seeing how biodiversity is seen. And it, the fact it was came out of treasury and not out of the sort of DEFRA or the environmental department was fundamental because people realized that it's a natural capital, it's a natural asset, and it, it needs to be factored in as a value to our economic model, even, even, if how, even how we look at GDP. Um, and if other countries can do the happiness thing, that's why can't we also factor in biodiversity into that? So it, th there's a whole conversation happening out there, which I find fascinating. I think we could even go to the conversation of degrowth and um, zero growth, which is all linked in this whole conservation rate. So community is one aspect, national parks, are, but the conversation is so broad at the moment. And what I would love to see is Africa driving that conversation, because one of the key things that we're all dealing with daily is decolonization of conservation. And we need to be part of that narrative and we need to be driving it and applying our best brains to those to that sort of whole e ecosystem and the thought ecosystem um and i don't think we're doing that yet i don't think our, poli our, our politicians are way behind the curve um and our academics are staying as academics 
uh, NGO guys are being activists. Uh, people need to come to the table and say, listen, this is a problem which we can actually benchmark the best case um, the best case formula in the world, and why can't we do it? And I'd love to see that. And hopefully, Richard, it's what you guys are teaching at, uh, at your, your academy as well. For sure. And, and that, you, 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 I think you've nailed it. That's exactly the point. Africa, in many respects, is one of is, is um, a global conservation leader. Some of the models that have come out of Africa over the past 20 or 30 years, again, I'm thinking of the sort of Botswana model, the Namibian model, the the Barboy model during campfire, the Kenyan uh, conservancy model, which has evolved over the past 20 years, and et cetera, et cetera, are, are unique almost globally. The world has a lot to learn from, from Africa, but I think where, where we suffer is exactly what Chris has just said, is, is from a, uh, you know, the, 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 the policy environment, the policy and regulatory environment within which we operate um, is often hinders any of this kind of innovative new thinking around biodiversity and ecosystem services and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's a huge job to be done to educate the political class about the opportunity that sits before them. Um, you know, um, we're, we're going to be talking as a planet about, we're talking about, we talk about carbon credit. It's my view. Others will have a different view that we'll be talking about biodiversity credits. They may not be credits, but there'll be something similar uh, in the future. Um, if you have biodiversity, you're going to be able to operate in a global market to sell credits, just like you can sell carbon credits for, uh, for profit um, and for, for, for significant financial, um, uh, you know, for, for sig significant um, financial income. So, that th those opportunities, those financial instruments, the mobilization of the capital markets and the corporate markets, it's all happening. I don't think there's a lack of money. Interestingly, people talk about how conservation is underfunded and ill-resourced, and that's true, but it's not because of a lack of money. What it is, is the inability of conservationists to make themselves investable, for some of the reasons we've talked about, and it's a lack of understanding of what it takes to make successful biodiversity investment. But that gap is beginning to close and Africa needs to be right at the forefront of this because we're the ones with all of the natural assets that are gonna be so valuable going forward. Amazing, amazing. So, so eye-opening. Um, so we've talked about um, some, some insights coming out of this is kind of shattering the stereotype as local communities um, being kind of backward in an understanding of preserving these and always be, you know, when you talk about human wildlife conflict and thinking of conservationists as other people who are trying to talk to communities to understand the importance of these assets. So that's a new way for some people of looking at things. And then this idea of natural capital and Africa, you know, actually, you know, the UK example that you gave Chris and actually factoring this into GDP is radical, right? Like it would, put everything upside down about what's a rich nation and what's not. Um, and then decolonization of the conversation, very insightful. And this is the beginning. I and mean, we can have many, many more and create a forum for us to educate the political class and others about new ways of looking at this asset and exploiting it um, for the good of everyone. Um, there's some questions here um, that um, can can push this forward a bit. I'm just going to take a bit of a break and talk about the trophy bans and the hunting bans, because this seems to be um, a question that comes up a lot. And the, I, the, the simple question is, do they work? Do we have science that says um, that if you want to protect a certain class of animals, that the way you do it is by banning trophy hunting entirely? Or is there new knowledge about that that balance? Um, do you know more than we do on the street? And can someone shed light? I, I would put my foot forward very reluctantly because as both Dr. McGendy and Richard know, it's a hugely emotive conversation um, and something which people are um, have got very strong views on. What I would say is that, and we believe in science-driven conservation, the science has shown very clearly that Kenya's wildlife diminished by 70% since 1970 
talking about large mammals, based on, and you have to draw the correlation yourself, on the fact that we banned hunting in 1977. So, sorry, Chris, you broke off for a minute. Um, so Richard is uh, contributing to your point. Uh, he'll be right back. Okay, go ahead, Richard. Okay, was was I that radical that I pulled off? That someone <laughs> turned off your mic. I don't know what happened. Somebody oh, okay. hacked in. But, but if I could just finish on that. You see, that's what I told you. It's very contentious. Somebody just hacked in and did that. But um, no, I think the issue they say is, listen, we've looked after our wildlife very successfully. Um, we're dealing with closed ecosystems, which we have to manage. We have to be God. We, the days of game walking across Africa, you know, uninhibited are long gone. And in some closed ecosystems, we have to cull animals. Um, and that's, again, science and evidence driven, because if any of you ever seen an animal starving to death because there hasn't been enough grazing, those of us who remember the Sabo crisis in the 80s, where we had thousands of elephants dying slowly, talking about three or four months to die from starvation for an elephant uh, because there wasn't enough grazing. The Sadek country said, listen, we have to cull to do, you know, to maintain these pristine and just for humanitarian, I mean, for, you know, for the, for the ethical reason that animals should be well looked after, animal welfare. Now, if we're going to cull, what is the difference between us shooting it as a ranger, um, allowing a poacher to shoot it, or allowing America, who's got a very diminished sense of ego, to shoot it and pay us $60,000, which goes towards conservation. And it's a very, very attractive argument, because that animal is going to die, and if it's going to die, then allow it to die in a way that contributes towards conservation. And that's their argument, and I think there's a lot to be said for it. I won't take a view on it, and certainly not with my organization's hats that I will wear. I'll be off my boards in about 30 seconds. But I do think it's worth thinking about, and I do think the science, we have to detach emotion from it. I think we're very speciesist in how we look at many of our things in this world. Um, and I think, um, but I'll, I'll stop there. Suffice to say that I think it should be an open discussion, and it might not even be large mammals. It could be down to bird shooting. It goes right down to fishing. You know, how, to what extent do we allow local communities to fish? And... Uh, it, and, you know, creating income out of fishing. It's all part of the conversation on how wildlife can be used to the benefit of conservation. So I'll just park it there and watch the comments explode. What is speciesist? Can you shed light? Speciesist. I mean, species is very simple. Isn't it? People people have, have no qualms with eating a snail or a slug or an insect, but they'd have very huge qualms with eating a horse or an elephant. Um, and you know it's how much of that is driven by science and how much of it is driven by um the factors that one looks at sentience so, i mean that's the whole conversation for another day but ostensibly people like big cuddly things like me and um, they don't like small wriggly things so they've got no qualms with hitting a snake over the head with a rock i hadn't thought about that okay great um very interesting we have a nut uh, but is this um uh, Chris, when you talk about that correlation of, uh, you know, the culling and all of that, so so there's studies that have shown that this is um, directly correlated to, well, correlating not being causation, right? But but that hunting doesn't necessarily mean um, that if you have a hunting ban, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, numbers will increase or vice versa. We don't know no, the answer fact, to that. I, I think mm -hmm. just to add to that, and again, I haven't taken a view on it, but there is a very strong argument that areas that abandoned hunting, and Dr. McGendy talked about it when Botswana put in their hunting ban in um, 2014. Um, certainly, if you look at some of the larger tracts of land in Tanzania, they are maintained by hunting in hunting blocks. And that is why Tanzania has been rolling out um, hunting blocks, apart from the economic upside, is that they haven't had enough capacity and maybe some would say competence to manage large tracts of um, wilderness. And so what they've seen is that actually, rightly or wrongly, some of the best managed ones, and of course, some of the worst managed ones as well, have been those which fell under a hunting block. So it's it's a it's a it's a diver, it's a very um it's an interesting conversation, and everyone's got a view on it. And I would I would I would add that you know, hunting, the way I look at it, um is that hunting is a, and I'm going to put this into into a sort of um, economic speak. So forgive me, but I, it's, hunting is a way of adding value. It's a value add activity, as Chris says. You can 
you can cull an elephant and pay a wage to a ranger, or you can find some fellow from America who wants to come and shoot it. Ultimately, ultimately, the elephant dies. By bringing in a hunter, you theoretically place more of a value on the head of that elephant. Um, and I know that's unpleasant for many people. But this goes back to what I was trying to explain earlier. It's about placing a value on wildlife. And there are there are many different mechanisms for trying to do that. When I work on Old Pedita, the way we placed a value on wildlife was by developing a thriving tourism business. But not everybody can do that um, because tourism in places like the Central African Republic is a non-starter. Um, so, so, you know, it's, 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 I think the argument should be about that. How do you make it worthwhile for the people living with wildlife or alongside wildlife? How do you make it worth their while investing into sustaining, tolerating, and living with wildlife? And there are many different mechanisms, and there are evolving mechanisms, which I talked about earlier, uh, which I think will unlock many different opportunities uh, for people. Yeah, so we, we have a couple of comments here. So so one is from Nancy in Zimbabwe, who says that um, she agrees with Chris's uh, argument about culling for various reasons. But for her, the, the difference is really if, if we think that animals are, um, you know, have emotions, um, have feelings, can feel pain, family units and all that, that's where the conflict kind of kicks in for her as, as we learn more about animals as, you know, humans. And then here we have a question from uh, Dr. Richard Ayer um, talking about uh, wildlife conservation and public health. So he says that wildlife-human interaction uh, is an opportunity um, to look at for disease discovery, treatment, discovery for the world. Are there any examples of these opportunities being recognized or being exploited in Africa or seen as part of the ROI on wildlife conservation? Does this come up in your discussions in the field? I, I think on that one, this is twofold answer. One is the negative, which is biopiracy. Um, and I'm sure Dr. Richard is aware of that. There's a lot of biopiracy happening at the moment on our synthetics and our, on all manner of our bi uh, biodiversity, which is people extracting it for their benefit without giving any, any, any sort of benefit back to the communities or the country. But a very good positive example, I'll give you an example, is snake venom. Um, and, you know, at the moment, there is a lot of snake venom being exported from Kenya to people to create anti-venoms in the States. Now, of course, the next level, like anything else, is why aren't we doing the processing here rather than exporting, you know, a <laughs> something, a resource to be processed and added value there. And that conversation is about that as well. And I know there's a conversation going on about us creating our own venom, um, anti-venom factories here. The two big ones in the world are in India and in America. But I do know that we're one of the biggest suppliers of the anti-venom that they use to produce um, their anti-venom. So that's that's a very positive one. You can go right down to the macro with bee harvesting and bee venom, scorpion venom harvesting. I mean, there's some very interesting stuff going on out there at the moment, which is um, at the forefront of biome biome analysis at the moment, where people are looking at the different biomes in in feces of wild animals and learning what we can extract from that for medicine is like way beyond my pay grade. I mean, th th that stuff is fascinating. 26%, I think it's 26% of modern drugs and things are going to change with the onset of AI and et cetera, come from um, animals or plants. So the drugs that are commonly used to treat us for cancers and et cetera, et cetera, come from, and, and so therein lies more value. Um, and another good reason, that it's, it's an ecosystem service. It's nothing, it's nothing different from that. So, um, so I, yeah, I mean, I think, there is lots and lots of um, research that is happening, but where your where your ecosystems become threatened or disintegrate, then the opportunity for that that kind of stuff to happen um, obviously diminishes. Lyle, if oh, I could I just see. add one thing on that, I'm, I'm not sure Go if ahead. we're going to have to discuss it, but a huge area that as Africans we we aren't discussing in conservation is, of course, our our marine protected areas or even if they're not protected areas, our marine ecosystems. And 
that is an area, but both of this answer to this question in terms of ethnomedicine and the ability of nature within the marine environment to provide things that are beneficial to mankind. I mean, in terms of not just our um, contiguous zones, our economic zones next door to our territorial waters, but even up to the areas of beyond national jurisdiction, um, we need to be at the conversations about that. There's currently, the world's split up into major big um, um, jurisdictions, marine jurisdictions outside territorial waters. And the one that particularly impacts us guys on the East Coast here is the, the South Indian Ocean Fisheries um, Agreement. And Kenya's just got ratified um, this year to join it. And I wonder what we're going to do in that space because our marine, our marine ecosystems are incredible and we're actually just barely touching the, the surface to mix metaphors on what we could be doing and how we could be protecting them and also how we could be um, getting them to, to, be, uh, to Richard's point is into PSs and other things like that. So I think that's something we're really way behind on. Um, and most of the conversations are being done by the big fishing countries like the Chinese and so forth. And I think those are, those are things we need to really elbow our way onto the table on. That was just an aside. I don't know how I got that in there, but I had to say it. It's a very important point. Most of Africa, the, 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 the marine protected areas within the jurisdiction of Africa and African countries far exceed the landmass of Africa. And yet we never talk about them. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, it's, for me, it's an incredible statistic. The, 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 again, I'm sorry, I'm going to talk about value, but the value, the potential value of the blue economy uh, if properly managed, is ginormous in terms of uplifting people's lives, um, and you know, clearly can be operated in a very sustainable manner, as has been proven in other parts of the world. So, yeah, I mean, Chris, I think is making an enormous point here, which is there's a there's a significant part of the sort of conservation environment of Africa that we never even talk about, um, and and it's of incredible potential value for the for the continent. Yeah. So going back to this idea that when people think about wildlife or, or this, every, everybody has kind of their pet species or their the vision or image that comes into their mind. And, and we need a much broader view of this. Dr. Mugende, I don't know what you think about all this and how it plays out in the South. Did any of these points um, resonate with you or any comment um, that you'd like to make? Uh, there's people asking about the con convival, conservation, and, and all these concepts. Tell, tell us what you think about the discussion so far. Okay, okay. Uh, coming to the issue, I think there's this new concept on, of uh, convivial conservation, you know, that has been termed and that we need to move towards that particular. Uh, so convivial conservation, in essence, is approaches where in conservation sort of becomes part of broader structures of trying to share the multi-dimensional uh, multi world that nature embodies. That is what the concept talks about. And they also talked about uh, having conservation basic income. So that is also a form of sort of incentive, incentivizing communities who are living with this particular resource. It's also about social, achieving social justice, social well-being. So that is what's broadly what the concept is about. And perhaps that is where the future of conservation, where we need to look into, uh, into that. So it's broadly described and people actually advocating for that to say, we need to move towards this uh, approach of convivial uh, conservation. Mm. Okay. So when it comes so it's, to it's a bigger so term for what uh, Richard was talking about, uh, this idea of um, um, interdependence, uh, especially yeah. economic. Yes, okay, go ahead, sorry to interrupt. But I wanted also to move back to us the issue of the hunting bands, you know. When you look at the voices in all these debates, the voices mostly emanates from the global north. And their views, particularly when you look at animal rights groups, they often, uh, what is missing from the discussion is the voices of the local communities who reside with these uh, uh, with these uh, animals, with this, with wildlife, for instance, you know, that is, I find sort of, I don't know whether to say, if, okay, they are miss, they've got this misconception, like one is saying, okay, they've got even mass emotions and so forth. That trophy hunting is, uh, it's not good for for animals. So 
for me, they need to take into consideration the people who are staying with this particular resource, take into account. These communities, they experience human wildlife conflict on daily basis. Lives got, get lost. Communities are killed by these animals and there's no the compensation for that is too little. So they need to take to counter, to take into consideration such issues of human wildlife conflict so that we can approach this uh, issue holistically rather than just looking at one side of the aspect and leaving the others. And also we say that, okay, fine, it's science driven, but all, of course, where are science, the ideas of science originate coming from? Also from the global north. We tend also to, to ignore, for instance, indigenous knowledge, which is key also in terms of management of these uh, resources. So to me, those are the key critical issues that perhaps when we are debating these issues of hunting bears, this needs to be taken into consideration so that we form a holistic approach towards finding a solution to, to trophy hunting. I agree, hundred percent. You know, I um I would just add that um that, that I, I I may have come across as sort of being against national parks. I'm not against national parks at all. They clearly have a an incredibly important role to play. What I'm arguing is that if we are to, in many parts of Africa, wean ourselves off the sort of dependency on the global north and their opinions and their money, we have to find a way of uh, being able to exist without their largesse and their influence. And there are many ways that we can begin to do this. And actually the solutions are holistic. There's going to be, there's no one thing that will change everything and make um, conservation an instant success story. There will be national parks, there will be community conservancies, there will be consumptive use. There's going to, this is going to be a mishmash and it's going to have to be adapted on a, a country by country uh, basis based on the politics and, and uh, national perceptions and et cetera, et cetera. So this is a very complex space, but it still for me goes back to this notion of value. How do you make it valuable? How do you make it investable? How do you make it an economic opportunity? And the moment you begin to do that is the moment you don't have to rely on the opinions of the global north or their money. Um, you can actually begin to self-determine and, and export a product, which is what I was saying earlier. A Africa is a world leader in conservation in many, many different ways. And that is an exportable opportunity in my view. We should be exporting our expertise as well as the value of our assets for, for people who want to invest into biodiversity assets or whatever um, and, 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 and benefiting, benefiting economically as a result. I wonder if, um, as we, oh, did you want to finish um, to contribute yeah. to that, Chris? Yeah, just very quickly. I think one thing's um, one thing that, in terms of value, which is often overlooked, and I think you know, I 100% agree with Richard's point of view about value. But value is often there's a social political dynamic to it. There's the historical, and there's also the biogeographical context to it. But one universal value that always remains. And I think it's again something that we need to focus on is people's belief structure in conservation. And I think that is something that is huge in terms of once you can align people's faith or belief structure with their view of conservation, half the work is done because they're not being driven by any capital model or any benefit model or anything else other than they, it aligns with their core values as a human being. And I think those models where they've done that and they've tried to align conservation with the local community's faith value, um, whatever that faith might be, it has been incredibly helpful in conservation work. Uh, I just sort of throw that out there whilst talking about value because it's probably the most important value. That's a whole summit unto itself, right? That's just wonderful. Um, you've, you've all alluded to it at one time or the other. Can you give us a sense of the landscape of the politics of conservation. There's somebody who's asking in the Q&A about, you know, who are the top three largest funders of conservation globally? And uh, for people looking at it from outside, who do we think are the players and how do they tend to um, kind of art articulate their positions or 
or jostle for opinion. We would like to know what goes on in your sector. <laughs> Anyone brave enough to give us a quick overview? Well, we could start with the three largest funders. Well, I, I, I'm the three. Hey, go on, Chris. No, no. I, you know, I'll, I, what I would say will be contentious. So let, let's start gently with a nice, gentle appetizer. Mine wasn't going to be that gentle. I don't think. I mean, I think a lot of the time it's um, it's it's uh, it's uh, small, um, under-resourced, stressed conservation organisations operating in difficult parts of Africa, scrapping with each other for a very limited donor pie with almost zero collaboration uh, between them because they can't afford to collaborate because they're all fighting over the same limited resource. Uh, I'm afraid that in many parts of Africa is is what you see. Um, and, and you know, some of the bigger organizations, I, I, I can't remember the statistics exactly, but there are some estimates that float around the place that to achieve 30% of, of the planet sort of in inverted commas set aside for conservation, we need, I think the figure is about $800 billion a year globally. And right now we have something like, again, I can't remember the figure, seven, 70 billion or $80 billion. So the shortfall between what is required and what is available is massive. So you've got a lot of people fighting over, um, fighting over resources which are insufficient. And that doesn't lead to collaboration, it doesn't lead to any kind of coherent approach to conservation at scale. So somehow that's got to be bridged. And with the best will in the world, with the best will in the world, the bigger organizations who fund organization who fund conservation, and here I'm talking about and let me not mention names, but the bigger organizations, you know, they 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 um they're not the solution. They can't be the solution because they can't bridge a gap. The gap that exists between 80 billion and 800 billion or whatever that gap is it's something like that they yeah. simply can't do it they, they they themselves don't have the resources so that's why i'm afraid i talk consistently about finding new ways of valuing um valuing biodiversity um we've got to find a way of bringing in more resources then we can cooperate and collaborate and do things at scale but whilst we're fighting over inadequate resources for my mind that's never going to happen yeah, so by a lot of bingos, um, and some have very restricted views on what their fund, funds can be used for, and some are very, a lot more open. And I think there are some that have, have taken a place that um, governments should have done, so the sovereignty issue, you think of the large land buying or conservation organizations um, who are buying up huge tracts of wilderness. On one hand, they're to be applauded. On the other hand, I think there is a sovereignty issue there. And the big conversation there actually goes back to the conversation we had about the decolonization of, 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 of conservation, because we might have just placed one colonizer with another. You know, what's the difference between having come through post-independence um, conservation for it to be placed with a couple of very high net worth families out of, you know, out of the states? Or give, I'll give an ex other example, let's say the animal welfare groups who arrive with very clear agendas. And when you look at their constituency and their demographic, it's completely undemocratic in terms of how they have driven our policy. So those sides, there's pros and cons on it. Um, and I think we've got to tread very carefully uh, about that. I mean, one example I've seen now is that as soon as politicians see there's money, everyone starts circulating, um, so, not circulating, everyone starts heading towards the honeypot. And I'm afraid we're going to see a lot more of that. But if we look at the land mass we have, it's between 8 and 13%, depending on whether you're talking about reserves, of Kenya's whole land mass. And then you look at biodiversity credits and the, you know, the opportunities that will happen there, let alone the, the carbon credit market, which at the moment, huge amount of money. And that money, if it's plowed back into conservation, would mean we wouldn't have to be reliant on bingos or family offices or animal rights organizations. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, I see a question here or a comment from Faisal, and he's talking about uh, elephants know not of country boundaries, and uh, really talks about this situation where you have one country that's protecting very well, um, but then the we, we drive these elephants into another country where then they get hunted down. 
Uh, would the panelists from Kenya know if this matter is being addressed by our government? And I think this really goes to this idea of regional cooperation. Maybe you can tell us about whether we're moving forward in contributing between countries. I think we got the idea from you, Dr. Mugende, of a much more sophisticated way that people are taking care of their wildlife. Um, is this the same in other regions or um, what do you think, Richard? Not to the same extent that you find it in Southern Africa. I mean, we work in the Kaza region, and I know exactly what uh, Dr. McGinn is, is is talking about. It's um, South Africa has done much better uh, in that regard than East Africa. Certainly, um, West Africa. Frankly, this kind of discussion hardly exists a lot of the time. Not always. Um, and then you talk about the Congo rainforest, which is doesn't really matter where the uh, often doesn't really matter where the national boundary is so um you know again it's different places require different solutions but the trans frontier conservation approach is much much more prevalent um often quite successful in the southern african country it, there needs to be more of it certainly in east africa I'm not sure that I'm really that well qualified. Wildlife moves, wildlife needs space, um, particularly species like elephants. Um, and we have to somehow create that space. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's you know, think of Kenya, think of Amboseli National Park. Amboseli is, Chris will know because he's on the board of KWS, but it's a tiny little park on the southern boundary of, of a southern border of Kenya uh, with Tanzania. And those, those elephants moving across that ecosystem are only using the park for short periods of time, and then they're moving trans trans uh, trans frontier and across other parts of Kenya. Uh, so if you can't protect that area, then then your elephants are obviously going to be vulnerable as soon as they move out of the national park. Okay, we're coming to the end of our conversation, and um, what I'd like to do is just ask each of you to give us. What just a summary of your thoughts, just a minute or two about what you would like the audience to take home from this conversation. Um, we'll start with you, Richard, and then Chris, and then Dr. Mugende. I mean, for me, there are two there are two key things. Um, I think um, the world has lived um, in opposition to biodiversity um, for the past probably a hundred years. The rate at which we're um, the rate at which we're doing that is not decreasing at the moment it's probably increasing as a result of that we have ecosystems uh, on the edge of so-called tipping point which is a complete collapse of those ecosystems so i gave the example of insects um many people um if i if i gave you one simple statistic two simple statistics the insect populations of europe as a whole um, are estimated to have fallen by between 70 and 80 percent in the last 30 years and 90 percent 95 percent of the reason for that is human activity and i gave you earlier the, the you know the, the example of, of of the value of insects from a um, sort of crop pollination perspective well that can be replicated across the planet if you think of marine systems i think it's i think i'm right in saying 65% or maybe it's 60% of um, marine fisheries are overfished. Sooner or later, they're going to be pushed to the point of complete collapse. And the impact economically that's going to have on the people who depend upon the marine environment for their existence, which is something close to 2 billion people globally, is ginormous. And the point that needs to be recognized is those systems, once they collapse, once they've gone past their tipping point, cannot recover. It's not, it's not a question of simply leaving them and hoping that they'll come back. They won't. Um, so we're right on the edge as a planet. And so, you know, these new solutions that we're talking about, the increased uh, scrutiny upon the need to recover and steward biodiversity is a really serious conversation. Some people say it's more serious than the threat of nuclear war um, and then the threat it poses to humanity. Um, but thankfully, there are these models that are evolving, particularly the sort of uh, financial models that we've touched on which are beginning to evolve and they do offer this enormous opportunity for a value to be placed on biodiversity which will result in people being incentivized to steward it look after it live with it um, uh, and and sustain it 
And I think that's 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 great. The problem is it's probably not happening fast enough. Probably needs to be taken more seriously. But I would end by saying that hope is not lost. Because whilst we're on the very edge, actually we're still at a point where we can recover. Um so the work that I think conservationists do around the world is is just of incredible importance right now. Uh, but I do think there is hope for the future. That's good to know. That's good to know. Chris? Yeah, I think um, there is obviously the concern that we're, what they talk about, the sixth extinction, you know, is that going to happen? I think it's very, very real. I, I always get concerned that we're perhaps for, focusing far too much on carbon and going net zero, which we need to. But if we reach then 40, 50 years time and we've had all the extinctions that we are predicting at the moment, then it will all be in vain. So I, I think my one, one of my core things is let's start focusing on biodiversity at the same time as carbon. But if you look at all the resources that are going into carbon compared to what's going into maintaining our biodiversity, it's a drop in the ocean. And to Richard's point, yeah, we're, we're only providing 1%, the, the figure is 1% of what's actually needed. And that's through people like GEF and so forth as we have to deal with habitat loss, over-exploitation, invasive species, climate change, you know, all this, and pollution. So I, I think there's a lot of work for us to do there. I do think that we're really blessed to be in the global south. I think we need to frame the narrative. We need to control the narrative. Um, we need to make sure we don't replace one form of neocolonialism with another. We need to hold our governments to account. It's a national asset for our, um, for our children's children. Um, and we need to educate politicians on that. We also need to start looking at, as Richard says, you know, the values. How can we make sure that it delivers value? I, I really think we need to look at our whole economic system. This is not just the global south, but glo um, globally. If we really care about the environment and uh, biodiversity, we need to look at our excessive cons you know, consumption, our lack of sort of um, incorporating eco um, ecosystem values. That's what I love about the Das Gupta. Let's look at that. Let's look at the inequalities uh, and poverty that come out of conservation and through conservation can be also be addressed as well. So there's there's that whole conversation I think that needs to happen. And um, all those sort of causal drivers, we are still at the cusp of being able to control them. And I think from a, I'd like to end with a sort of bit of what we say, conservation optimism. You know, I really think, let's look at some of the success stories from Dr. Mogandi's point of view down there, what they've done. Let's look at the white rhino, the black rhino populations. Let's look at how Namibia has managed to reduce its um, bycatch by factors of thousands. You know, there, you know, there's so many good stories out there. Um, and I'd love us to sort of focus on those and encourage us to move forward and hopefully um, leave the world in a place that when we die, it's slightly better than we found it. Thank you. Great note to close on. Emmanuel, you get the last word. Oh, oh okay. Right. For me, it's, it's, it's mainly about how do we balance conservation with uh, rural development or development in, in, in general. So the key issue then becomes for us to achieve, for instance, social or sustainability in general. We also have to ensure that local communities are seen sort of co-investors in nature-based economy. You know, people who are living with this must be at the center of these transactions that are happening. And also that communities need to be treated as equal partners uh, with their own conservation as well as development aspirations. So we have to take that into consideration. But as well, I also, perhaps challenge everyone to simply say that we can see that the resource sovereignty of Africa is a bit challenged or is a bit compromised. How then do we, what models perhaps can we come up with? Or what are the possibilities? How, how sort of do we come, uh, how do does Africa regain resource sovereignty? How does it forge new political economic relations that then can restore Africa's resource uh, sovereignty and we stop depending perhaps on, on, on donor funding from the global north. How do we sustain that? So it's food for thought for me. Thank you.
Thank you very much, everybody. All of you have teed up our future conversations <laughs> on this topic. I can see there's a lot of opportunity for us to bring this knowledge and uh, advice to a broader community. Um, as we just um, make this conversation more nuanced and more relevant for our times, you've raised a lot of solutions, but I think we have a very big role as Aspen and with you to really um, start this conversation and take it to the places where it needs to be had. Thank you for educating us, um, for enlightening us, and uh, for giving us your important, precious time this afternoon. Um, and I hope to see you soon on another Aspen discussion. I'll hand this back over to the Aspen team. Thank you, Chris, Richard, and Emmanuel. See you soon. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, our panelists. Thank you, Lila. And um, thank you for that very, very insightful conversation. So at this point, at, uh, as the Aspen Initiative Africa, we will continue to host these uh, thought-provoking and enlightening dialogues that are data-driven. Please follow us on social media, and our social media handles uh, are at Aspen Africa on X and uh, LinkedIn at Aspen Initiative Africa. Please also keep an eye out for our next events and gatherings. Thank you.